Yeah, to everyone. Thank you, Joel. Um, and uh, my name is Clarita Lefkambigay. I'm a citizen of the Diné Nation, and I'm an assistant professor at the University of Washington, and I study water security. Thank you. Thanks, Clarita. Um, our first youth representative, Lindsay Pasena, could you introduce yourself, please? Hi, everybody. My name is Lindsay Pasena Little Sky. I'm 16 years old. I am the chairwoman of the Confederate Tribes of the Umatilla Indian Reservation Youth Council. And I am enrolled in Castilla, San Felipe Pueblo, and a um, descendant of the Oglala Lakota Nation and Hopi Nation. And I'm so happy to be here today. Thank you, Lindsay. Um, Ms. Joni? Jude? Nick Pukshwe, Inish Wanisha, Nijoni Tilido, Putim Ku, Oinup, Anwich, Sinusha, Mu, Imatelam Sinwit. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Nijoni Toledo. I'm 17 years old and I'm speaking uh, Imatelam. And uh, I am a uh, the cultural ambassador for the Confederate Tribes Umatilla Indian Reservation Youth Council and a role member. I am currently a junior at the Nikiawe Community High School and I'm very thankful for being here. Hi, right, Katsiaya, thank you. A couple from Nikiawe, love it. Love to see our fellow sister tribes. Um, and then the final youth representative, Kay and Singer, could you introduce yourself, please? Okay. Hey, hi, I'm Kian Singer. I am from the Confederate Tribes of the Umatilla Indian Reservation. I am a member at large for the Youth Council and I attend Nikki Alley Community School and currently a junior. Thank you. All right, welcome everyone. Um, Melinda, are you in the breakout session? If, if not, um, let's see, I will, so let's see. You get to see all the names um, that uh, we just got introduced to. Um, so going forward, um, we do have a, a, a fair amount of uh, questions that were posed in the chat box. And uh, I will, um, let's see, I'm trying to do a lot of things at once. Um, so some of the questions, um, uh, Jenny, that were posed in the chat box uh, direct uh, for food security, um, uh, one of them was uh, talking about the USDA requirements. Um, and uh, how strict are those requirements for processing um, meats and the canning processing that, that you talked about? Um, and uh, they, they also ask, um, I don't know if uh, you guys work with fish, but their question is, would processing of fish require similar uh, USDA requirements? Okay, can you hear me? Okay. Okay, so when we receive the, the grant from USDA for the aquaponics, um, I was slated for a farm to school project so that our youth can come over and start to look at that. Um, and of course, if you know, I'm, I'm a tribal, tribal leader, so I only know little bits of everything in the tribe. I don't know, I don't know the details, I'm not the expert. Um, but what that aquaponics then turned into, um, turned into an experiential learning facility. Um, and then also kind of morphed into the farm to school uh, courses at the high school. And then what that lettuce, the lettuce there that is grown, um, I believe it's 30 pounds of lettuce on a weekly basis during the school year, that lettuce goes over to the school. So what those students are learning is where their food where their food comes from, how it's grown, the care that's needed, 
um, how and when to harvest it, and then uh, distribution. So when school's not in session, that lettuce then goes to our nursing home. Uh, we've got a 40, 48 bed nursing home that that product then goes to. Um, so what we did with the uh, the regulations, we then did our own regulations here through our governing process is called LOC Legislative Operating Committee. And what we do there is we put together those policies and it goes through the public hearing process uh, for public input. Um, and then it becomes law here. And then you mentioned the fish. Um, uh, on the pictures on there, those those bins underneath there, that's where the fish, the fish are. And um, uh, the waste from that fish is also gets turned into nutrients. Um, I don't know a lot of the details on that on the fish portion. I know it's tilapia, um, and there's a certain uh, fee that they get for those fish to help with that to tomatoes, uh, the lettuce that's grown there, the tomatoes that are grown there, and then that building. Uh, we put that up and it's about the um, size of a small house, like 28, 28, 28 by 56 maybe. That building was put up right next to our veterans building. So our veterans, uh, our director of veterans services helps with that. And then he has certain veterans who have taken interest, um, who want to help the community that vet there's a handful of veterans then that go over and, and help take care of uh, the aquaponics to make sure all uh, temperature is right, it's temperature controlled, uh, make sure all the lights are on for that. So it's, it's, a nice, it's a nice facility and I've seen other tribes have aquaponics and just not being able to keep it going. Um, and it, we've had the aquaponics, what, since 2016 now, so. And that's a nice program. Those veterans, they baby those plants, they talk to those plants, you know, like it's their child. That's how much they care for those. Thank you, Jenny. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and and please, um, everybody who's who's uh, participating in this breakout session, keep putting the your questions in the chat. I'm just going to go through ones that were posed in the the uh, general session. Um, they uh, one one person had a question regarding. You mentioned that uh, Onada was um, uh, working with cattle and producing beef. Mm -hmm. um, they were their question was about. Um, um, beef being traditional or not traditional, and how does that fit with the overall planning um, since, you know, beef, beef was imported to this country? Mm -hmm. um, well, let's start with the buffalo. Um, probably in the early 70s, our farm director wrote for a grant to see about if we could get some buffalo here. We were able to set aside some land with fencing and to be able to 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 have our own buffalo, a small, small herd. And then that herd has grown. And buffalo, we did have buffalo um, in Wisconsin. So that is, buffalo meat is traditional to Wisconsin. Um, and now I think we said our herd is up to 160 and uh, 160 uh, buffalo. And that gets processed through an outside agency. Um, the little town next to us has a, uh, a facility for processing that buffalo, but for the for the beef, of course, that those were all imported, and you know, like any tribe, we adapt things. You know, you you bring things into your canoe that is going to help your community. So, um, cattle is not traditional, to, uh, one of our traditional foods. Um, so we've adapted, like any tribe. You know, what is going to help your community. And during the summer, during the pandemic, you know, it just kind of make everybody sit up and, and take notice. You know, there was a, there was a, a meat shortage across the United States this past summer, earlier in the pandemic, you know, we'd go to the grocery store, 
uh, it was kind of rationed. You know, you could only buy one or two uh, pieces of meat at a, at a time. And that's when we were like, hey, you know, gosh, thank goodness we have our buffalo farm, we have our cattle, we, you know, our, our black Angus uh, to help supplement that. Okay. Thanks, Jenny. Mm -hmm. um, uh, another question is, um, have, you, uh, have you seen uh, more people become interested in learning about uh, traditional foods and, and food security, uh, food sovereignty um, um, over the last couple of years? Are they, turning, are they turning back to traditional foods and medicines? Mm -hmm. I think over maybe the last 10 years, you know, there's the whole food craze, you know, everybody's trying to eat healthy. And, you know, that's hit Wisconsin too, that's hit Oneida. People are looking for those medicines um, to kind of get back to your, you know, original way of life. Um, those traditional foods, you know, using our white corn, learning how to, um, to grow our, our own white corn. I mentioned June Hankwa and in, in the slides before, and that was developed as a learning center. And what we, we've had a group here in Oneida that has taken that same philosophy um, of, of educating, of teaching people how to, to grow your own white, white corn. So that group, that's a separate group, it's the, called the White Corn Growers Group. And they've probably got a group of probably 15 to 20 families who came together um, with a plot of land. Uh, somebody said, hey, you know, my barn is over there. You guys can use that. Um, uh, somebody else borrowed them a tractor and they were then able to grow acres and acres of white corn and in the whole process, educate those family, teach those kids how to be out in the garden, what to do out in the garden, how to behave out in the garden and then also how to, how to harvest that. And what they, that group has done is um, they're starting to be recognized on a national level with their efforts of education. Uh, a few years ago, they were invited to South America um, to share their knowledge of, of corn, of, of the white corn, and, and do comparison. How are they harvesting down there? Um, and how are we harvesting up there and what we can do to share, um, you know, just, just like our traditional songs. In, in Oneida, we've got um, an alligator dance. Um, we don't have alligators in Wisconsin, but in the past we have had people travel to Seminole uh, and then they traded, they traded songs, you know, and that happens in, in the foods in the food world as well. You know, trading of those seeds, you know, that's something that we've always done. So um, you also mentioned, so yeah, we do have a lot of people looking for medicines. Uh, June Hequa also provides classes. Um, plant identification. We have a plant, uh, I think it's bergamot, it's called number six. It's one of our medicines for teas. They do plant identification. They do, uh, we plant uh, rice, wild rice um, in one of our, our local ponds. Um, so constantly trying to do uh, educational initiatives and bringing in, bringing in those youth because us as leaderships, leadership, um, we've got to engage, we've got to well, first of all, we have to believe in it and understand that that's, that's what we were put here to do, is to help educate. And, you know, I think if your leadership is enhancing and promoting that type of way of life, people, people will attract to that, you know. And with the whole food craze kind of sweeping across, you know, everybody's talking kale, you know, um, we're talking white corn here. So, yeah, thank you. 
Yeah, that, 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 that's really good to hear. Um, you know, uh, and you know, this is that we we have uh, almost seventy people in this breakout session. Uh, you know, in the Northwest and across the country, um, tribes and non-tribal people. I mean, we're really interested in this subject. So, you know, mm -hmm. it's reconnecting to the land, um, to our traditional foods, and it, it's really good to see that. Um, so the couple questions go to um, how the tribe is set up structurally. So was there like a department of, of food or agriculture set up um, within Oneida? Um, talking some questions were about how do, does it mimic what feds or states do to protect the, the health of the citizens, make sure it's safe food. Um, could you go into a little bit about how how that um, is structured and and how how you um, funded it? Um, does it come from like does a tribe get grants or does it does a does own um, tribe commit some hard dollars from their businesses to mm -hmm. to help this? Um, well, I think our first food initiative um, was the cannery, and that was back in the seventies. We had two women that started the cannery, um, and they had gone to the local county or to learn how to produce nutritional, good nutritional food, um, form that relationship and then realized, you know, we, we really need to put together something here for our own community, you know? So then they then uh, wrote for some grants um, for the start of, of the cannery and then started the build on that cannery. And then, um, then we realized, well, you know, we, we've got to have a farm to supply to the cannery um, then the Oneida Nation farms were uh, were built probably, well, probably in the 80s. I think when I graduated high school, we had the farms that were just uh, starting out. And, and then over the years, added more components to that, you know, writing for more grants, putting together policies here um, for that. Um, of course, you know, every understanding that food security and uh, Food knowledge is something that our community needs. Um, and then starting to allocate monies from our gaming. So including in the budget every year, uh, more monies for those areas. Um, down in the cannery, some of those boilers, some of the boilers go down. You know, we have to have those boilers for the white corn. Um, so always, always having a portion of of our food security embedded into our into our budget. You know, then of course, always looking for grants. Um, at the Apple Orchard, our, our tractor had gone, it broke this year. And with some of the CARES money, we were able to purchase a new tractor over at the Apple Orchard. And with the Apple Orchard, um, we've probably had that for about 20 years. And over the last maybe 15 years or so, you know, it was just a, it's a small orchard, you know, well, they've got uh, 30 different uh, apple varieties. Uh, what we start, we realized we needed to do is we can't just be an orchard and not promote to be able to make sales. So uh, Highway 54 comes right through Oneida. Um, that wasn't enough just having the orchard on the side of the road, no promotion, just a sign out front. So what we started to do was put together an event every summer and um, we named it the, the Big Apple Fest because we're Oneidas, we're from New York. The Big Apple is in New York. We needed to sell our apples, so let's name it the Big Apple Fest. So that started out with probably maybe 200 people the first year. Um, and we have that on the grounds, um, probably about two miles from where our orchard is. And we run um, uh, horse and buggy shuttles up to the orchard. So you can go, you can park at the grounds. It's uh, Amelia Cornelius Park. You can park there. We've got log cabins that were uh, brought to the site, to the park. And those are the log cabins from the 1800s. Um, there's about six log cabins there. Had our event there, took horse, horse and buggies so that people could come to the park, go up, pick their apples, come back. And then we started to have um, like a small rodeo, um, 
ponies that do tricks. So not necessarily a rodeo, but performances by a local vendor, a horse farm that would come in, do some entertainment for the kids. And then it has grown so huge. Now we have the farmer's market comes up there and that comes with 30, 30 vendors. And we get about 10,000 people every year for that. Um, and then we have our veterans groups. We have uh, different groups that sell food. Uh, veterans always do chili, um, different vet veterans groups. You know, there's Indian tacos, there's fry bread. Um, and there's educational purposes. And there's also a small uh, longhouse replica where you can walk through and they provide tours there. So that's one of the events to help with that sales of those apples. And we, that's probably about 10,000 people that come through to that event now. Of course, we couldn't do that this year because of COVID. Um, you know, so looking for other ways to help promote and sell those apples so those apples aren't going bad. You know, you've got to be able to store those through the winter. So coming up with different, different ways to promote the apple, the orchard, and, and get that that uh, that product out to community. Thank you. Yeah, that's that sounds like a wonderful uh, wonderful event. Um, and I'm I'm uh, how how are the surrounding communities? So it sounds like that the tribe is definitely um, really on board. And but how do do you get much participation from the just the general community there and you know Green Bay around the reservation? Uh, that is promoted to our local schools. So it is our communities, not just Oneida coming there. Um, Green Bay schools, uh, Pulaski schools, we we get from all over the place, and and uh, probably at least coming from at least a hundred miles around coming for that event, because it's a, it's a really nice family event. There's no alcohol. Um, there's powwow exhibitions. You know, we're selling apples. We're doing that to sell apples with a little bit of education on the side. Yep. Yeah. Hey, so um, speaking of, um, uh, you know, there's a question regarding folks who, who maybe don't live um, in, in a rural or, or even suburban areas, but they're in urban settings. Mm -hmm. do you, have you, um, do you have any recommendations for, you know, urban natives or, or non-natives who are living in, in urban areas that want to um, start reconnecting with with these traditional foods or the land and and uh, getting back to um, food security and food sovereignty? I think maybe having events because a lot of times if you're from the urban areas you don't know anything about farming you don't know anything about horses about cows so us having events and inviting those people out to our reservation um, to learn to learn about it what we offer that we have Black Angus, that we have Buffalo. Our Buffalo herd is also right off of Highway 54. There's an overlook so that you can uh, look at the Buffalo, you know, in a safe distance and, and be kind of a little bit over them so you can see them real nice. Um, so I think having those events and welcoming those people um, from the cities to come out and learn about agriculture. Uh, we've got another a uh, plot of land uh, that we're working on. This is future, future development, uh, probably about five, six ac acres that is just on the outskirts of Oneida. We've got NWTC and um, Northeast Wisconsin Technical College um, close on the outside of Green Bay. So Oneida butts up to Green Bay and there's a college right on the edge there. And what we're looking at doing and um, looking at partnership, doing a partnership with NWTC and also with the Menominee Tribe, who is about an hour north of us, um, to be able to provide egg, um, egg classes out at that site. NW, the college needed some land to be able to do that. We're able to do that. We're able to provide some of that education as well. And along with Menominee Tribe to come together in that partnership to, pre, to provide those classes for those students. Nice, nice. Um, 
A couple questions regarding, um, so you talked about buffalo and you have a herd, but do, do you, have you incorporated like traditional hunting or traditional gathering into the food sovereignty and security efforts? Uh, we have. We have started over the last probably five years. Uh, we did get a grant, oh, I forget who it's from, uh, for trails program, for trails to run through. So what, then what we started to, well, you know, we should probably start to, to plant some fruit along those and some nut trees, some traditional nut trees to the, you know, uh, from the area along those. And then as, as people are on those trails, being able to, uh, to educate, do some education on the side, um, that uh, food, uh, food security education along the way on the trails. Nice. Um, so, so the, the this this um, event is focused on climate change and tribal climate resiliency. Um, so, there's there's one question regarding um, impacts, climate impacts from from farming, um, mm -hmm. and specifically farming meat. Um, mm -hmm. Has the has um, the tribe uh, taken any actions, or they do they consider sort of the carbon footprint of of either your beef operation or the buffalo operation uh, on, the, on the climate? Uh, yes, yes we do. We have an environmental department that um, watches any pasture runoff because we've got a few streams that run through, uh, run through the reservation that we're trying to protect. So our environmental department then has gone out to, to the local farmers, educated them and included them you know, bringing them to the table so that they have a say, they, they understand what we're doing. And we have had so many farmers um, that are so willing to put, put those buffers, you know, on their farm so that that runoff is not going in into their waterways, into the streams. And then we also have uh, a farm, we have the buffalo farm and then we have the regular cattle farm. And because of the climate change, uh, we're not getting uh, as much snow as we used to get through the winters. Um, so that coverage uh, of the soil it is not the same as it was 20 years ago. You know, so we're making adjustments to, to help with that, uh, the way that those plants need to adapt um, to be able to survive with these changing, with the changing climate. That, that, that's good. You know, I'm glad you guys are, um, you know, I, uh, looking holistically on on the impacts and um, and and all, all the all the all everything that um, uh, I think could be a consequence from it, good and bad. Mm -hmm. um, the um, I don't know if it, so on the screen right now we have some kind of overarching questions and maybe we kind of want to end end our breakout session on these. Um, oh, okay. So I don't know if you can see them. Hopefully you can. Um, uh, looking at uh, what, so so Oneida has really taken a lead as as we we've we've, um, we've we've heard um, from your presentation. I mean, you um, other tribes are learning and, and wanting to replicate some of this. Um, but do you, so does Oneida still have um, needs in order to to continue um, this effort? And maybe through your discussion with tribes across Indian country. What what are what are the the primary needs that tribes have um, when trying to reconnect with their traditional foods and start producing um, the the these uh, these foods for their people? Okay, okay. So um, so my presentation I didn't do myself. We have I have staff and we have departments that all help with this. So I'm going to read you my prepared statement and then I'll I'll tell you what I think. Okay, so national tribal policies and food security education programs help support tribal food sovereignty, having the resources and tools to produce, process, distribute, and educate their, their community will improve food access, food security, and nutrition-related health disparities that challenge Native nations. It's important for members to have food security, to have enough food to lead an active, healthy life. This can be done by restoring traditional foods and practices which in turn strengthen cultural
cultural identity and the relationship with Mother Earth. So in my voice, I think everything is about sustainability. Having a plan, and I talked about our food model in the, the first presentation earlier today, um, having a plan um, because in the early 90s, we had all these different um, departments. We had June Hanqua, we had uh, the farm, and we had the buffalo, but we didn't connect those. And I think being able to put together that model that connects all of those and incorporates education um, into that, and then taking your tribe with you, you know, including your tribe, you know, this is where we want to go. And, you know, it's like building a house, you have to have a plan. Where do you want to be in five years? Where do you want to be in 10 years? Um, putting together that plan, where do, where do we want to be in 10 years with food security? Okay. Thank you for that. Yeah, I know. As, as a former tribal council, I, I know that there's a lot of folks that are lifting you up and behind behind mm -hmm. you, supporting you. And so mm -hmm. <laughs> I, I that your comment about knowing a little bit uh, about a lot of things uh, hits home. <laughs> yeah. uh, but, um, but, you know, we, we talked about in, in the in the panel discussion about um, the new administration, you know, we're excited, um, finally, um, and we got a lot of repair work to do, but we're excited and got a new Congress. Mm -hmm. um, what do, what do you do? You, what do you think the um, some key messages are um, to the new Biden administration and to Congress about tribal food sovereignty? What, what do you what do you think we should be telling them? I think, I think the first thing you do need to do is establish some relationships. Now, um, Don and Terry came out and visited Oneida last year. And, you know, us living here, we, I think we get nose blind. That we have so much happening that we don't realize it. We don't realize that we've got a really good model here. Um, so, Having met Don, spending the day with him and Terry, having that relationship, you know, and, and now look, I, I'm on your summit, you know, um, but doing that same, doing that same thing uh, on a, a state level and a national level, you know, getting to know those senior advisors in DC, you know, letting them know what we have to offer here, what we're capable of doing, that we have, you know, the wherewithal to do. And then, um, and because our, because our native foods are so intertwined within our language and our traditions, um, so by promoting our food sovereignty uh, and uh, that also uh, promotes our self-sustainability, our self-determination, um, our self-sufficiency, um, so everybody's ultimate goal is is to be able to provide for the next seven generations and i think being able to take that message to the new uh, federal administration letting them know that we're here we want to see that at the table um, and that we are doing everything that we can um, to keep our sovereignty oh yeah that's a uh... The constant fight, the constant battle, and and uh, you're right. Um, our our traditional foods are a big piece. You know, they tie mm -hmm. directly to our traditions and our our ceremonies and culture. And so, yeah, that's a big piece. And um, you know, um, I really appreciate you you um, um, uh, saying yes and being a part of this um, this event today uh, because I, Oneida is leading the way in a lot of respects, and and the people, the tribes here. And um, our allies who are participating can can really learn a lot. Um, mm -hmm. You know, uh, I'm just looking at the time, and uh, I don't know, Clarita. I haven't I haven't got any. Um, we any have one minute. Or, okay, okay, because I think they're just going <laughs> to automatically kick us out. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, so just just be prepared that they, we might just get bumped back to the general session. Mm -hmm. um, but re really appreciate all all the questions too. They they've really been um, on point. And, um, and, and your responses have been um, 
uh, remarkable. And uh, I think the question three that was regarding um, how the Native community has access to the food for the families, I think oh. you addressed that during during um, your, your, your answers. But if you have anything more to add to that question, that was from, from one of our youth. Um, um. Uh, 40, we got 44 seconds. Um, it, when I talked about distribution, we also have our, um, we, we put our, our traditional foods out to our one stops, our gas stations. We have five of those. And then we also have that market that we talked about that we, you can always go get corn, uh, corn bread um, that's produced from our cannery. So um, that's one of our distributions. The apple orchard is a distribution and our, our apples of course go to local stores um, and you can stop at the orchard. So thank you so much. I appreciate everything, all, all the presenters and thank you so much for having me. Yeah, thank you, Jenny. Um, thank you everybody who participated.